Thank you very much for being here. Uh, could you please first introduce yourself in a few words? Hi, I'm Ian Shaw. I head up the um, equity incentives team at Oric, um, and I've come along as the token boring tax lawyer. So I do the techie bit. <laughs> Um, I'm Dominic Jackerson, and I work at Index Ventures in a talent role. So, you know, Flora said some very kind things a few minutes ago. So, I've done the, I've done a lot of work around stock options and uh, equity awards, working with our portfolio of companies, and also, uh, uh, you know, now talking to you know, at, at forums like this as well. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christian. I'm the um, CEO and founder of Capdesk. So I actually have no financial background at all, but that's why I got so confused when people talked about shares and options. I was like, where the hell are they? Like, but they're not there. So I decided to make a platform where I could actually see them. <laughs> and now I've spent the, yeah, a lot of, uh, the past four years trying to correct all the errors there is when you actually see them on a platform. So that's why I'm here. Perfect, thank you very much. First question is, like, obvious question, why, why giving equity to employees? Maybe you can first. Um, well, I think um, the main advantage you have the earlier you are is the equity. So I was actually out to an incubator mentoring uh, last week, and they all had an option pool of 10%. We'll get into that. And none of them were using it. And I was like, well, that's the only thing you have. You're a founder with 90%, and you have 10%. Use it for something. And I think many people are too afraid to give away options because they're like shares. Um, but it's actually the earlier you are, the more attractive options is and the harder, you, the easier you can actually get some money. So I'll give you one example. One of my friends, um, out of actually the Danish Navy SEALs, he's got no tech or no sales experience. He got offered an opportunity to sell to 100 restaurants and he'll get 5% of this company. So he did it, and then the, the two months after, he said, you can get another 5% if you go, he sells to 300 companies. He did that, and now the company is too good to go, and he's one of the main shareholders. Um, so it's just to say, if you... It's, it's a, that's why it's a good opportunity. And if you understand that, then you can get a salesperson to work for you for nearly free. So, yeah. Perfect. It's, okay. um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll just trade that. I, I think the, 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 the key thing is that you're cash poor uh, when you start you know, in a startup. So you cannot afford to pay the same level of cash compensation, especially for technical talent, but generally speaking, as a larger, more established business could. And you're in a very competitive environment now, especially for that technical talent. There's no way you can pay anything like, let alone the later stage startup, but you know what a consultancy, a bank, a big corporate doing a digital transformation project could. So if you're trying to attract and retain the, those individuals that you, is absolutely critical to your success as you're growing the business, uh, you have to look at secret weapons. And you, know, you can appeal, and it is still absolutely critical, the fact that you're a startup, and you can appeal on having a very different sense of culture and mission than what people could get if they joined a, a, a big, boring company, to put it sort of mildly. But, um, and more and more people want to make that switch. But at the same time, the other side of the, you know, the, other side of the coin is joining in that journey is sharing the upside if the journey goes well. And that's where the equity comes in, or the stock options. Uh, and that's obviously been the uh, driver and the sort of flywheel of success in Silicon Valley. And you know, really, you know, what events like this we're trying to do is, is support that ecosystem and its continued development in Europe by bringing that equity incentive uh, culture into Europe and getting it uh, entrepreneurs excited about it and getting potential employees excited about it as well. There's a massive education gap to go. And you, Jan, what, what do you think about sharing equity with employees? Maybe it's a mess for lawyers like to manage all the, the stock options then with the contract and so on. Yeah, I'd certainly echo what Dominic said, and certainly about buying into the company culture. There's a, uh, a horrible phrase called corporate glue. It sort of binds everybody together. And I was having a look earlier about a survey that was done a few years ago, and they'd interviewed 4,000 employees um, at various different companies, and there was a wide spread perception among the employees that share plans encourage various sort of productivity enhancing behaviours. Um, people were saying that, really? yeah, I mean, <laughs> those who had participated in share plans were more likely to work beyond their contracted hours. They had uh, lower levels of absenteeism. Um, plan members said that the share plan had a causal effect on their own motivation, and they are more likely satisfied with their jobs 
if you're loyal to the company, um, share its values, and Viewers is a good place to work. Sounds and, like a lovely story. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a one-way bet. That's what an option is. You know, if you, if you buy in to shares and you've paid real money, you've, you've got skin in the game, and that might be suitable for certain top execs and obviously is inherently suitable for founders. But um, with a share option, you're saying, you know, if the, if the share goes down in value, you don't have to exercise, of course. You walk away. But if it goes up, you share in the upside. Yeah. Yeah. I think what you just said is that uh, I always say this to my team that, you know, the beautiful thing about, you know, uh, share options is it's like a love baby to, to, between communism and capitalism. <laughs> because you are democratizing wealth, but at the same time, you are telling them to work hard. <laughs> and it's basically what it is. Uh, th this is totally, I agree with that. Because to me, it was like how to reconcile capital and work and labor. Like in France, we have hot topic with that. Because there is, for yeah, but whatever. We're here in UK. We're not here to speak about France. Perfect. So thank you very much. That was. But is it also Dominic um, a question for entrepreneurs? Maybe yeah, to sharing the upside. But like more HR question, like to of course attract talent, uh, motivate them. That's it. Um, so you, hang on, you're asking what else is in it for entrepreneurs? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the key things are that attracting talent, so you can hire people you couldn't otherwise. Uh, and being part of that. I think actually even more important in Europe at the moment at least is about retaining that talent. Um, because what happens if you are successful and your business continues to scale, uh, at some point, you know, if you raise your Series A or a Series B uh, and you have that continued success and you're now a business of like 100 or 200 people, you will become a target for people poaching from your company. You're visible, you'll have had funding announcements, you'll have media coverage, and you'll have recruiters chasing your team members as being a great team. And why should they stay with you? Because you probably still can't pay the sort of salaries that they could get an investment bank uh, uh, or, or at a, you know, a system integrator or whatever it is, or agency or whatever. You won't be able, still won't be able to get them the cash amount. But so why should they stay? Again, culture, mission, etc., is absolutely critical. But if you've given stock options which are part vested and they'd have to walk away from those stock options which they were granted very early in the life of the business at a much lower valuation. They're walking away from a potentially very large economic loss and that creates a moat to people leaving. Um, you know, obviously, if, if they're partly vested, then they could walk away and uh, uh, exercise what they've had, which is, again, it's to this communism capitalism split that you know you you you've earned you've earned what you uh could walk away with but there's more on the table there's continued potential upside so stay with us on the journey uh don't sell your soul and go and work at a corporate or whatever stay with us and um yeah enjoy it and benefit from it so communism and capitalism if you have twitter you can like tweet it and this is a quote from christian gabriel so it could be like then <laughs> Laura and I've got a very personal example of that. My, my wife worked for a company she was um, very happy with for the first sort of three years of the yeah. vesting period, and then for the last year, she she quite wanted to head off, and she was she was being um, approached by various recruiters, etc., offering as Dominic says, plenty more money. But um, she looked at the corporate culture. She was sort of broadly happy, but I think would have moved, but for her options, mm -hmm. and she got the EMI options, which are granted at nil. So there's a bit of income tax to pay, as we'll, as we'll come on to, but that's what made her stay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Can I say something in of course. Just to, to ruin the romance uh, for the employees, but something for the founders is that when founders give away options, they're always like, oh, I'm giving away 10% of the company. I think it's between 0.1% that actually exercised options. So I think it's just very important. Like It's very, very low because the chance of you going bat bust, it's very, very high. And the chance of you exercising your shares between it and not having an exit-only clause, it's, that's, that's also like 50-50. So I think we, we don't see a lot of exercise, at least on a platform. And when we look at it, we're like, oh my god, there's not enough options getting exercised. So just get it out there, because it's going to move around throughout the story. And it's going to change. It's not like you give it away, because the employee might want to move on, and that's fine. So it's just that founders get a bit paranoid. No, you, you're right. When you're talking about percentages, without the, the, the whole picture, people, like, you, you cannot understand how it works. It was a, the same, like, even for, like, any employee, even if you're a CFO, you, you cannot understand if you're missing one of the key elements to 
understand how it could work and what could be the upside. But I have like other question, of course. Uh, and the other one is, how does it work in UK? So Jan, could you explain what the scheme in UK and you shared with me some slides? I did, yeah. The first one is um, why EMI is so good. And I hope you can see that from back there. But essentially, it's easiest just to explain by way of an example. So on the grant of an option in the UK, as opposed to just giving somebody the shares, um, these shares are worth, um, are worth £2 at um, the time the EMI option is granted over them. If, we were, if you were to just give those employees shares worth £2, they would pay tax today on something worth £2, because otherwise you could essentially pay people and not pay any tax. Um, so there's no um, tax at all when you grant the option, which is great. Um, and that's the case in most of Europe, although not all. When you come to exercise, um, so this is a non-EMI option to start off with. When you come to exercise, you've got income tax and potentially national insurance contributions. So there, the market value has happily gone up to £3, so you've chosen to exercise. And you've had to pay, in this um, scenario, you've had to pay £2 to exercise. And you've got something worth £3. So you've got tax on one pound, as you might expect. Um, you hold the shares, and happily they go up to four pounds. That is um, capital gains tax, which is at 20%. Now, that's not too bad, but when you compare that to an EMI option, you see how good these are and why we're at close to the top of Dominic's table in his um, excellent book. In fact, we were top of the table in version one. We've gone down to fourth in version two. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't tell you about this. <laughs> so again, no tax on grant. Um, and if you've granted your EMI option with an exercise price which is equal to the market value of the shares at the date of grant, there's no tax on exercise. And that's great if you let somebody exercise at a, at a time when they can't sell the shares. Because it means, um, yes, they have to pay the exercise price, but they've no tax to pay. So they've no what we would call a dry tax charge, i.e. tax charge with no money to pay it from. And then they've waited until the sale, and they've sold the shares um, at £4. And you don't get away with this bit entirely, but it is capital gains tax. And if there's a delay of two years between you being granted the option and you selling the shares, you get, and this is, this is a brilliant addition by the UK government, um, not something we expected at all, because CMI options were frankly good enough already, you get the 10% rate of capital gains tax. So you okay. get the entrepreneur's relief rate, even if you don't hold the 5% of the company. So, so, so EMI, is, does it mean that this is specific stock options or just a tax and social regime attached, like a favoured one? Yeah, I mean, it's, bo it's both, really. Okay. You set up a sort of formal EMI, which stands for Enterprise Management Incentive Scheme. Um, and it's for most of you guys, I would expect, to qualify. There's certain trades which don't qualify, like um, shipbuilding, steel, okay. law... And There's this, never any sympathy at that. Okay. Um, but for, for, for you guys, most of you should qualify. Um, it's basically, you've got to be an independent company and you've got to do and most of the sort of things that, that you do will, will, will qualify. Do you have specific conditions to be qualified as an EMI? Um, you do. There, there are certain limits. It's £250,000 um, okay. per person on day one, which again... So is, not is everyone can use thing. EMIs? Yeah. Not everybody, okay. but most of the guys in the room, I'd be surprised if they couldn't. Okay. And Dominic, this is why we, uh, you can have a seat, uh, this is one of the reasons uh, UK is scored in your uh, ranking yeah. pretty high. Yeah, um, it's, it's a very major part of it. I mean, this is, this is significantly better than if you were holding stock options in the US, um, which I think is really noticeable. As what, what US about? is pretty high up, but uh, EMI options in particular are a lot better than the US in, in terms of the tax rate is lower, the fact that you only have to pay tax at the point of sale, so you're never on the hook even if you leave the company for a tax bill. Um, and the fact that the price that you have to pay, uh, that exercise price where the red line is, is very low. So you don't have to cough up usually a very, very large amount of cash to exercise your options. Again, which is very relevant, I keep on coming back to levers, which is a little bit, you know, sometimes gets entrepreneurs a bit antsy because you know, so much of this is about retention. But if you're going to build a really big business, it's going to take many, many years to do that. And you have to expect that 
most the majority you know I, I've, you know, companies that we work with, uh, you know, you, I generally say if you, if we invest at a seed stage company or a series A, maybe there's 10 people in that company, excluding the founders, by the time if you get to an IPO, if you have a huge exit, then you'd be lucky if there's one or two of those people still in the company at that point. And it's not because they, their performance suddenly dropped generally, it's just that their, people's lives move on, move on, they might want to move overseas, they might... Have children they might you know just want to the, the company culture just becomes it becomes a big company they want to go back and do their own thing all these reasons and it's sort of about it's great emi options are great because it doesn't penalize the employees for then saying look it's time for me to move on so from an employee perspective it's um super super positive yeah, yeah sure. we're just chipping in there actually uh, being the boring tax lawyer that um you um you retain if you do leave you retain the bit of gain that you got as an employee, so you won't you get income tax if you're allowed to keep hold the option until an exit. Um, you get income tax from the value on the date um, you leave up until the date of the sale, but um, you keep your, t your good tax treatment um, okay. for the for the bit of value that you accrued um, while and you're an employee. How how employees can understand that? Do do they have to to, to manage it by their own, or is it the company? Maybe Christian, you you have. A an idea about that, uh, like, can provide a lot of info, guidelines. Yeah, question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Simple and hard. I, I will ask everything for you guys. In terms of communicating it to the employees, so, so I think there's, um, I mean, there's a lot of hoax going on right now when I see the companies explaining their options to the employees because of uh, two things. So first thing is, you know, um, they do the share price, contra the real share price and so forth. But secondly, which is most importantly, is that when VCs come in, you've got different share classes, which means that um, your right to cash, you know, earn out, it's not predictable. So if you say, I've got 1,000 options, if I buy them for 50 pounds, then a share, whatever, it turns into this price, and then I set it, then that's not what you're going to get. So a VC has got clauses that make, maybe gives them 2x the money out or back before the ordinary shareholders get anything. So that means if you've got 10%, perhaps you only got 2%. So, so when you explain the equity value, typically, so we, they actually all asked us to build in our software, can you please just uh, time a current share value uh, with what their, their current value is and show them how much they've got in the net worth, you know, <laughs> on the platform. And we, you know, we said, no, like, we're not going to do it because it's not the right way of communicating. And, and can you just show the percentage then? Well, the percentage is not equal to it anyway. So I think it's really tricky and you have to educate your employees with what I see as exit goals. So you have to set up some exit goals. This is the exit goal that we're going for and we're taking in this investment with these shares, classes of shares. If we exit for below this threshold, then you won't get anything out. Mm -hmm. If we exit in this threshold, you would get something out and this is what you're going to get and this is how you do calculations. Okay. But they need to understand that logic. It's a bit like what's going on in equity crowdfunding, that you're selling shares you can't explain. Okay, we will dig in, into the communication part. Now. This is super clear, but I know you can keep the mic, I have all the questions for you. <laughs> because it isn't too hard for a company to track all the shareholders uh, you have in the company, because when you have 100 employees incentivized through the equities, it may be difficult to track it. And then it comes to managing your cap table. Yeah. So... Why is the link between, oh, it's like, yeah, how to translate it. But we can first, uh, I changed the, the way, sorry about that. But I, I think it's better to go to the cap table first and then to go back to how to translate it into cash. So, yeah, Jan, please. And actually, just, just stepping back on that point on levers as well, I think is important to address. Um, it's up to you guys as entrepreneurs to decide what you want a good lever and a bad lever to be. I mean, at one end of the spectrum, I would say, is a European big public company where good leavers are people who leave due to things like injury, redundancy, death, and it's a really tight um, group of reasons. Yeah, so it's harsh. <laughs> Whereas um, at the other end of the spectrum, I would say, is a, a US startup where the feeling is much more, well, I've given up salary for cash, so these options are a core part of my compensation package. So to the extent they're vested, they shouldn't be taken away from me, even if I go and work for a competitor. But it's, it's up to you to decide between which of those pools you fall. 
then about the, the, the cap table, you, you, you sent yeah. me like an example about how it works and usually it's a spreadsheet? Yeah, a, a, absolutely. Um, and you see, um, and this is, this is where, where you come in, and your, your system is mu much more sophisticated than this, obviously. This sort of thing can lead to obvious mistakes, as we'll probably find out, given I only put this together this afternoon. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, oh. All a cap table is, um, it's a share capital table. It just shows who owns your shares and how many um, shares they own. And then you generally have a percentage, which hopefully adds up to 100. And then you have this option pool. In this case, it's a 10% option pool, 2,000 shares out of 20,000. So this is your Series A. Then you get Series B. So you'll see here, two more investors have come in. They've taken some shares. Um, they've got their percentages, and of course, they've diluted the option pool, which is um, now 8%. So what do you do now? Um, because you've possibly um, you've got less of the company, percentage terms-wise, to, to give out. Um, so what you do is... <laughs> it worked. Um, I'm hopefully hidden by the plant. But um, you basically top your option pool back up to 10%. Um, in this case, you give... Um, 500 odd more shares. Um, and this is quite a European approach. On each of your series, you'll top your option pool back up to 10% or 15% or whatever it is. Whereas um, the US approach is to actually often not only just top it back up to where it was, but to actually increase it in real terms. So you might start off with 10% of your company um, as an option pool um, at your series A. And by your series D, you might have even, say, 20, 25%. And why, why, why was like how comes up your your idea to to like help people to manage their cap table because you, you're developing a company that's pretty easy the process of tracking and seeing all the shareholders. Yeah, yeah I mean it's I mean it initially happened when I was working with alternative finance and an investor asked me where is my shares and what are they worth and then I had in order to figure out what a share is worth so this is a this is a company that's got one share class, so it's quite easy because you've actually owned 10% of 100,000 pounds, so it's quite easy to calculate. But once you're further down the line, I've got... Some, some say the reason why it's called Series A, Series B, Series C is because you make a new share class called A preferred shares, B preferred shares, C preferred shares. So if you imagine that the Uber has a G, Series G round before the IPO, right, you can imagine all those different share classes. So all those different share classes, imagine those, let's just say 10 different share classes, they all have a preference or a participation in who gets the cash out first and under which conditions. And it's something I call legal entitlements. So legal entitlements is not shown in a cap table. It's, it shows who owns what percentage of the share class. And to calculate that, that's the essence of a, this is the currency we have. This is why we're all working in startups. This is why, you know, you know the, the VCs are looking into startups because this is the currency. But nobody understands it. If you go out to a Series B CFO and ask him, um, can you please figure out how much you're going to earn if you sell the company for two billion pounds tomorrow? He can't answer. And this is the paradox that I saw. And if he can't answer that, how would the employee then know what he's got? Or the founder know what he's got? Um, so what we're looking at is basically, once you're growing this, so in that first option pool, you might have 10 employees, then you might have 100 employees, and then you might have 500 employees. So that's 100 employees, which has got a crazy schedule. They best options at a certain way in a certain country that are optimized in a, <laughs> in a specific way. And, and that's, you know, we've got a company that's got daily vesting, right? So it means that they've got 500 employees that daily vest shares. So we thought that was a bit complicated, and so we've made a system that just tracks that. And that's kind of the story of what we do. But it's very much about if you understand the value of the share. So let's say this CFO with his $2 billion exit, if he understands the value of that, and if they, he knows that's the value, then you can do so much more with the shares. So we're looking into doing continuously secondary transactions where VCs are con continuously buying up the option pool so they can actually make a liquidity event, so they can actually sell their, uh, their options at a certain price every single year. So that gives you a new sec uh, secret power where you can say, you, this is the share price. If you work hard, next year you can actually already cash out, right? And then we can top up the option pool. So once we understand equity, there's so much more we can do. Um, and that's what you know, motivates me a lot. I think we're just seeing the essence of it. And I'm really glad that VCs are putting option pools in because it means we have to use them.
<laughs> yeah, that's really important for, for, for the companies. And also, but you mentioned it, you, you can cash out maybe if you have no exits. Maybe we can dig into it. And this is the, it brings the question, how can we monetize? How can we translate in cash the, the, the investment? Maybe Dominic could uh, have a few words on it. Either only the exit, that the only possible way to, to cash out, to cash in, <coughs> depends, but... Um, well, the, the main... The main ways of cashing out are obviously when you have some form of exit, as Florent was saying earlier. So <clears throat> that's either going to be a trade sale. So if you have a trade sale, you know, like um, uh, you know, one of our companies, you know, within the last 12 months, iZettle, was bought by PayPal for $2.2 billion, right? So hundreds of employee shareholders at iZettle at that point, PayPal paid $2.2 billion in cash to uh, all the iZettle shareholders, which includes uh, uh, all, all, all the employees who have, option, who have options. The, the technical way in which it works, because the vast majority of those employees won't have exercised their options, is that at the point of the transaction, you don't need to worry about this, but at the point of the transaction, effectively, your options will be exercised and then those shares will be sold to PayPal in this case, and you will get the money back less the exercise price that you'd have had to pay. But it's called cashless exercise. So you don't, it's simultaneous. You don't have to pay the money in for the exercise and then get the money back out afterwards. It's all just done net, um, which is a nice, clean way of doing it. Um, so that's one way which you might get your money back. Another is through an IPO. So that your company... Uh, IPOs, it floats on a stock exchange. At that point, there is an open market in which you can sell your shares into. So you could then exercise your shares uh, and, uh, again, sell them on the open market to get, recover the money. And there might be some constraints uh, on you doing that, like, say, for six months to avoid this huge sell-down of shares which would drive the price down the day after the IPO, which nobody wants. So you might have certain restrictions, but basically uh, those will fall away over... over uh, sort of six months to 12 months and you'd be able to sell the shares in the open market. So those are the two most sort of typically and traditionally the main ways for uh, turning your stock options into cash. Um, the third route, which is becoming, uh, it's just coming on the scene, it's become fairly established in the US uh, and it's starting to come into Europe, is the idea of sort of secondary sales. Yeah. And Jan sent me some slides about that with okay. cashless and also so we can dig into the, the, the slides you, you sent okay. me. The, the, this is uh, okay, yeah. just, just to say uh, um, yeah. on, on secondary. Oh, so this is, quite, this is still quite rare in Europe, but the idea is that if, now that uh, the life of a startup, if you're, if you're really ambitious and you're trying to grow a big business, like I said, iZettle's now you know, sold for $2.2 .2 billion, that was a pretty much 10-year uh, journey. Uh, from the start of the company. And that's uh, quite typical now, that sort of 10 to 12 year lifespan to get to a multi-billion dollar business. So um, you can have those em employees could be waiting an awful long time. And not just employees, but some of the very early investors, people who might have been angel investors in the company, they're like, uh, I'd rather just actually, I need my money back now, or those, those employees might. So you're seeing mechanisms whereby if, if there's investor demand for those shares, that when you raise, especially it's most common at the moment, when there's a new fundraise, you'll say we're going to raise this much new money for the company, so it's new money to fund our growth, but because investors want even more than we want to raise, we will allow some of those early investors and some of the established employees, you set rules for it, to cash in some or all of their vested equity, in order that they can see some cash returns, uh, which can be really important. Because again, if somebody joined when they were a startup in the seed stage, as one of the early team when they were you know, 24, and now seven, eight years later, they started a family and they want to put a deposit on a house, or on a property, it's like, well, I really could do with some of that liquidity. So it's, you, you get employees are extremely grateful for that. And the company benefits as well because it sends a signal to all the other employees who have stock options uh, that they're real money. It's not just funny money. It's not just pie in the sky. Actually, this is real cash. So celebrating those events, this is the message to entrepreneurs. Um, if, if you have the opportunity to do that, 
it's a positive thing. Um, you know, so, yeah, they, no, you, you, no, 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 no. <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's very important because yeah. it's, it's the obvious point, isn't it, that we're probably quite interested from a technical point of view on how this all works, but ultimately what people are interested in is the money they can get out of it. Of course, that and, the and, point, it's part of their compensation package, yeah. so that you, you have to understand what is part of it. I was going to sure. say, another variation that I've seen, this tends to be with later stage private companies, is actually establishing an internal market. So you say we're not going to use the stock market because you're subject to all sorts of techie constraints and investors look at you very closely and there's all sorts of reasons why you, you wouldn't necessarily want to float in that. In that. So there's just a lot more scrutiny it, it, it on public companies. It was a case for, for Tesla, maybe. Oh, oh. Yeah, and employees can like sell to each other mm. and sometimes an investor will take up the slack or you might even hear of an employee benefit trust, which is sort of like an employee trust buying. So if you've got more buyers than sellers, um, it, it might... So it could be a backlash at some point and yeah. okay, yeah, difficult to manage up, for, for the company. The Maybe they focus yeah. also the employees and so on. Yeah. Okay. And what about the slides? We, you, 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 um, you it's probably just me. worth very quickly whizzing through, isn't it? So on, um, on the um, normal exercise of an option, you pay your exercise price. And this, this, is in the, um, this is in the context of a transaction. So this is the target company. This option holder works for them. Um, and the buyer... Um, is trying to buy all the shares in the target company, obviously. So the option holder pays his excise price to his employer. The employer gives him shares in what appears to be an asbestos company. I don't know where that clip art came from. Um, the option holder um, sells his shares to the buyer, and the buyer gives him the cash. Now, the obvious point here is that this money has come out of the option holder's pocket, and he's had to... Um, however much his options are worth, he's had to find what could be a chunky exercise price. So what we do is something called cash as exercise. <laughs> so option holder says, I undertake to pay the exercise price to you, the company. So they've promised that. The company gives them their shares against the strength of that undertaking. Then the buyer um, buys the option holder's shares. And as Dominic says... The buyer gives the option holder his, um, his cash for his sale proceeds, less the exercise price, and he gives the exercise price, which the option holder has promised to the company, um, to the company in fulfilment of his undertaking. Perfect. I'm sure you have plenty of questions. I think it's a sales pitch on that one, so this is what I do. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> So we, we, we went through the cap table and we have uh, a person just at my left building a great company about managing the cap table. But then how much to give to employees? How you decide, uh, Dominic, to, to give like, for instance, 1,000 stock options uh, equal to 1% of the company fully diluted instead of less or more? Um, <clears throat> well, it's, it's sort of, if you think of this as like a, a market, how do you decide as a entrepreneur as a founder yeah how much you're going to give to different people in the company um well i've sort of built a model for doing this so by all means like in the book which is available online um called rewarding talent so it's all of, it's, a, it's all up there as an online book and there's also a, a a sort of free to free to use software tool called option plan um, which is, you, you can just Google option plan and you'll get to it. And it gives away a method of allocating, which is basically built that up by um, analyzing thousands and thousands and thousands of option grants uh, in the US, uh, a, a much smaller number of option grants in Europe, but working out what sort of different people, the, the main things that make a difference are the stage of the company, because the later stage of the company, the bigger the company is, the startup is, the less risk there is. And if you just think risk and return, if you join earlier, you take a bigger risk, you get a bigger amount of equity. If you join later, it's a lower risk, you get a lower return. That's the general rule. Um, so that's one big driver. And then what your role is in the company. So your level, you know, generally more senior people will get more options. Um, and the other driver is like the, the, the function. That you have so generally tech, people in technical roles will get uh the the largest option grants um relative to commercial or uh central functions and that really reflects supply and demand so there's a sort of uh, established like benchmarks that have sort of come into play based on this sort of market dynamics 
So sort of in, in option plans, sort of translated those into the European context and what those might look like. So for instance, if you're a, if you're a sort of experienced senior engineer uh, who's uh, looking to join a Series A uh, funded startup, you, you know, we might, um, uh, I think that was like 50% of your salary, of your cash salary in the form of options. So, you know, if that person was earning sort of 60, 70,000 uh, pounds salary, then they might get, you know, 30 or 35,000 pounds worth of equity. Um, and then you can do the sum sort of if that was a, you know, if that Series A funded company was worth 30 million uh, pounds, then that's a 0.1% ownership of the company that translates to. So you can sort of look at it that way. But if that company came to be a value of 300 million, that's a 10x increase, then you can see there's several hundred thousand pounds of uh, upside that you can get from those options. So this sort of, that whole, those scenarios and be able to do what ifs is all in the option plan app. Um, and that sort of, I'd say, is the, the general model I'd, I'd sort of put forward for uh, deciding who gets what, is what stage you are, what level seniority you are and what function you have in the company and those three drivers can really roll out into a sort of grid of how you allocate uh, and sorry it's another monologue here so i apologize but the critical thing i'd say is around um consistency and this is just a general theme around anything you do as a founder uh, around stock options and equity is consistency and fairness um because you're giving away your most precious asset. Your equity in your company is the most precious thing you have, uh, and you're giving it to other people. Now, if you're giving that equity to people and they feel that uh, they've got, you, know, you, you could be giving something to everybody, but if person A thinks that person B sitting next to them got more than they did when they shouldn't have, they'll feel pissed off, even though they've actually got something, they'll still feel negative, they'll feel worse about it, and you might as well have given nothing in the first place. So if you're going to use stock options, be consistent and fair about it. And therefore, is, yeah, you might not want to be, and might not be able to be completely transparent, but make sure if you've got something like this grid system, and you can say, look, this is a grid we follow. So you know, people can see it, they can sort of then understand why person X might be getting more than they are, whatever. But that is absolutely, if there's like one message around, if you're thinking of using stock options, you know, I'd put those two messages, consistency and fairness, in the way you allocate them is so critical. Otherwise, it could backfire. We can understand this is your topic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll shut up. <laughs> no, no, wait. No, no, this is my fault. So, no, but I was listening to what you said and you were saying it super clearly, but Christian, you, was it a hard decision um, to, to, to size your, your ease up and to allocate and to find a way, even if it's your own business and the market? Um, you're, you're I mean, I think it was, um, I think, you know, I actually, because obviously we work with it, so we had to be perfect, right? <laughs> um, I think there's kind of two stages of giving out options. Um, I think I got a bit confused of the later stage stage because we started when you're super early, you cannot pay market wages. Like you don't have even just a normal, regular, you know, CTO wage. You can't pay it. Um, so what we did is we built a model, and I like. The, I think consistency is, you know, such a good because we stuck to this model. We like it, and and our model was, and I preach it to other founders, is that you take your share price, you put it in there. So let's just say it's five pounds per share, and then you go for like our next funding round. The least valuation we're going to accept is the share price. Right, and then you take the difference between the two share prices, and then you take the the salary you're giving them, and then the top end just pick a ridiculously high salary, and you you, you calculate the difference. So let's just say it's a difference of uh, two thousand pounds a month, and then you two thousand times twelve, that's whatever, and then you divide that by the difference in share price, and then you say this is what I'm giving you, and that's what we did in the beginning because we could explain it, and then we said this is just the first upside, but. You know, it got much more further. It's not the end of the journey. No, so and, and, and it takes like 10 and, years. Uh, and, and, and then it changes, of course, because then you, you can't do that anymore. And then I like that way of accelerating, you know, uh, if you're a junior, you know, you have a 0 0.2 of the grant and then 0 0.4 if you're medium and then it accelerates up the more senior you are. But I think in the very beginning, it confused me a bit because, you know, I, I, it's, it's not hard. enough. Yeah. And then how much do you give a CTO on your second year, right? That's a, that, this is the question I get the most. 
for people. Mm. When it comes to an event and they hear what I'm doing, it's like, how much do how much I give to my co-founder? I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Can you look it up? <laughs> but and, and who decide? Uh, for, for instance, Jan, you, you've been working with like plenty of companies, startups. Uh, like who have the final words? Uh, is it like the VC that's okay, tell and easy to discussion and then you write the contract accordingly? Uh, how it works, who decide? And ideally you'll have something like a shareholders agreement whereby that's a legal document whereby, as I'm sure you know, whereby the VCs will say, um, we're going to put this amount of money in, we want this many shares and you guys can have an option pool which is 10%, say. And within the 10%, they'll say, typically, you, the board, can give it out to anyone who you like. You might have some sort of caveats to that. So you might say, if you're going to give out more than 2% to any one person, we want to be consulted first and have to give our consent or something like that. But um, you, you should have a sufficient relationship that you, there should never really be an issue with that, I wouldn't have thought, because um, they will want to incentivize the same people as you want to incentivize, I would have thought. Yeah, but it's the king of the game yeah. uh, together. And, and, and I, yeah, I, think, I think two points. When you looked at the cap table and you saw that um, on your Series B, the option pool gets diluted and then increased back up to 10%. Um, of course, if you're granting options to people, everybody who's actually already got an option gets diluted as well. So if you've got an option over 1%, it would go down to 0.8%. You don't have to top everybody back up. So if somebody you've given an option over 1% turns out to be no good, then you leave them getting diluted. So they get a smaller and smaller slice of the pie as they, as they go through it until possibly they work out that uh, they're not being topped up as much as their colleagues are. Of course. Um, and that gives a bit of headroom for the, um, for the sort of superstars. Okay. I think the other point was, um, just lo looking at, um, yeah. you were saying people were creating option pools and not using them, uh, and that, that's pointless. I've noticed in Dominic's book, one of the um, sort of common mistakes made by founders um, was that they perhaps give out too much equity too early. Uh, gave out too much equity too early. But, yeah, to, to, to stick with the question yeah. also, yeah, Dominic, do, do, do you think like this, of course, it has to be uh, an agreement between investor and also entrepreneur? Yeah, so the original question is saying, um, yes, I mean, usually, it, you know, investors vary, so I can sort of say what our stance is at index. I mean, as you can tell, it, it, seems, it always seems odd. It's another example of the capitalism and communism thing is that I, I, I find myself uh, at things, events like this as a capitalist, you know, venture capitalist, like how much more capitalist can you get? But singing the praises of saying, give more equity to your employees. Uh, and it's quite a nice, I, that suits my politics quite well, actually. But, um, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a rationale to it, right? So the way that works um, in, in practice is, yes, exactly as Ian said, we'll, we'll agree, the shareholders and the, invest, the entrepreneurs agree to carve out the pool, but then the allocation of that pool within such limits is, is uh, uh, determined by the board and by the executives. And often you'll have, if you have a sort of formally driven idea or grid, like I was suggesting earlier, uh, even then the board will generally say, if you're giving grants according to your grid, you don't need to ask us at all. You know, just, you don't even, you hardly have to tell us. If you want to make grants which fall outside of the grid, then bring them to a board meeting so there's formal approval. Um, but otherwise, it's just, yeah. you know, it's no how, issues. How, how was it uh, for, for you, Christian, when you, you already raised funds uh, with Capdesk? And could you explain and give an example of, of all um, those different steps? Of, of, of option, of option yeah, pool? Yeah. I think yeah. something we have to... Uh, with, the investor with, the option, with the option pool, something that's great and also challenging for an entrepreneur about option pool. If you Let's say you have 100% of the company and an investor comes in and wants to buy half, 50%. It's just an easy example, right? And uh, then it's 50-50, and then you, it go, after a year, you say, I want to give an option pool of 10%. Then both the, you, as a founder, and the investor pays 5% each. That's 10%. But if the investor says, before I invest, I want you to use your 50% and finance the option pool with 10%, then there's an option pool, he's got 40%, and the investor gets 50%. So the reason why we see these options pools increasing all the time is because the investor says, I'm not financing your shit. <laughs> You know, you got to finance that yourself before I put in the money. Uh, but I like that. I mean, I think that's an awesome thing because it, it forces the companies to use the option pool. Because I think mo most founders would be like, why should I ever give out options? I don't want to do it. Let's just keep it super low. But then investors come in and say, yeah, you're going to need it. You know, it's a bit, 
it's a bit like you know your mom saying Rain, wear this rain jacket you're gonna need it someday and you're like ah, I want to look cool um, and it's a bit the same thing really so so once you've got it you use it um, and that's what I felt and that's why I like the dynamics I preach a lot about it and I think you know when people ask me about venture capital I think it's the best thing venture capital has done is that they enforce all the winners of tomorrow to have a 10 percent option pool like imagine if we did that back in the back in the days like uh you know in the industrial era like it would be so much different so i think that's really cool sure. and was it a discussion with your investor before the fundraising uh it's for typically, example for the policy and all they have to yeah it's typically part of the it's the part of the term sheet so when you have got the term sheet negotiations which is how much percentage do i get for what then your term sheet negotiations is also uh option pool top up typically so um at least when you're dealing with vcs so we've got three VCs in the cup table Okay. Um, and this is how then, after like putting the option pool, then you decide you decided to 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 fix the internal ESA policies and place the option yeah. policy to allocate accordingly, as you said, like with different criteria. Yeah, I mean, when when we began like finding a technical co-founder, then we used um, some Danish originally, so we used warrants. But getting a technical co-founder. So that was milestone based. So we said, if you build this product, you get X, Y, Z options, right? That was because I didn't have any cash at all, like at all. So then they got their, <laughs> then they got their options, and then we have now said options. So I said I got my first funding round, and I said, um, so can you go full time now? And they said, yeah, this is what you have to pay. And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> uh, and then I gave uh, away half my company to them. So um, and then that turned, out, that turned out to be a really good idea. But this is, of course, a collective <laughs> game. You cannot, like, yeah. of course, uh, build a great company yeah. by your own. This is also why. Yeah. That's what I understand. Exactly. Sure. But so, so that's if you're a single co-founder. I would always say get co-founders in whenever I speak to somebody who hasn't got co-founders. But that's a different thing, right? Yeah, uh, that's a different thing. Option pool is different from co-founders. So just saying that. Uh, option pool is something you use for employees who are giving a salary and they don't have a stake in the company. Do you want to have the word? Yeah, on, on, yeah. sure. I think that how to communicate to employee okay, equity, quite. I think that ties in quite nicely because your sort of rank and file employees, being rude to them, may not understand it. And certainly in Europe, they haven't necessarily seen the Facebooks and the Googles of this world. So it's often a bit of paper they stick in a drawer and happy days in three years' time if, if it does come off. And, Whereas um, the US people are much, bit, perhaps a bit more savvy, certainly San Fran Bay Area, um, they will actually come and ask you for options. And they'll often they'll have a good idea of the terms of those options. And if you say, well, actually, this is going to be a 10-year vesting period, they'll say, well, that's not market standard. Um, you know, that's the, that, and they'll actually negotiate the terms. In France, they, they, they ask for voucher instead of equity, for instance. So, yeah, because we, we have no idea how it works there. And... You are more sophisticated here in UK and less compared to US. So imagine in France or maybe in Italy or maybe in like all the lower tech ecosystem, if I can say. Mm. So yeah, for sure we need to understand it because this is the point of sharing the upside and creating big and great companies. Yeah, and it's, it's no good, um, sort of as a lawyer, just putting in some very clever, whizzy scheme. You've got to actually explain why this is useful to people. So what I've done sometimes is actually just go, gone into the company and just sat down with the employees, be that three or four people, or it be a sort of twice the size of the audience we have this evening, and just said, look, this is how it works legally. This is um, why it could be valuable to you. You can't give financial advice, but you can say, look, if the share price rises, a rising tide floats all boats. Of course, the communication is super important. And you, you, you think that uh, also, Dominic, uh, in your book, uh, that the, the communication uh, is as important as the plan itself. Yeah. Um It's 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 definitely a massive part of the challenge because uh, these are you know these these are really fiddly instruments and there's lots of sort of small print and uh, nuances and yeah how on earth is an employee supposed to know if you're deviating from a norm uh, you know or not or what the implications might be it's very it's very difficult which is why I think the more we can uh, coalesce is the way the U S has around a standard way of doing this. The better, and that's one of the problems we have across Europe, is that different countries, different regulations, and also different just uh, practices, which I think is largely just because different groups of lawyers and founders have done it different ways. But the more that we can harmonise that, um, the more uh, employees will know that this is effectively a, a boilerplate contract. It's like they don't really have to uh, worry about it. They know it's going to be fair. 
uh, and uh, conforms to norms. So again, that's what all this education, and we're all trying to put out materials and uh, uh, and blog posts and whatever, and writing stuff to try and uh, make that day happen as soon as possible. Because uh, it's in everybody's interest if we've got a sort of consistent, shared idea of how these work. Okay, and uh, I, I just need like to to go like to speed up a bit because we we've been talking for an hour f so far, and we need to share. Uh, with you, with all the questions. But first, before we finish and go to a Q and A, the classic one, uh, maybe Jan, if you can have a few words, and maybe Christian, if you have also a word uh, on it about how to manage it, like when you're expanding your business. Uh, this is something uh, I mentioned earlier, like during the intro, and this is something I faced, and this is really complex. Yep. The short answer is it's complicated, and I'm sorry about that. Um, governments don't seem to agree on what the tax system ought to be for options. So I often get asked, we've got a US employee who's lived in France and worked for us for six months, does three days a week in Switzerland and is now coming to live in the UK, what should we do? And I said, well, that's probably a £50,000 tax question. I'm guessing you don't want to pay us that. Um, so, yeah, um, it, it is complicated. People make careers out of this. Um, and there's no, there's no particularly easy answer other than we lobby the EU to sort of harmonise the tax system um, relating yeah, to share Because options. basically there is a competition between the countries in the EU there is. about uh, taxation. Uh, Every, uh, each country won't like tax, uh, yeah. wants tax uh, and, the, the, yeah, the capital uh, gain, and, and like or, or, or worse, it, it, can, it can be in, what's capital gains in one country. Even can be if it's good to pay country. taxes, okay, don't get me wrong, this is good, <laughs> but you could end up theoretically paying taxes on the same amount in two countries, and that's why we have, without getting too geeky, we have two, we have like international tax treaties between different countries. There's there's like web of different tax treaties, and sadly, um, tax lawyers get paid to um, analyze those but I mean, it's a very very broad general comment okay. um, if you have a vesting period of say four years and you've spent one year in the UK the UK will generally seek to say well you've been in the UK for a quarter of this vesting period so we'll tax you on that bit if you've been in France for the three quarters of it we'll tax you on that bit so the, the tax treat is sort of okay, there so, and you have to manage it you are the company I mean, that's that's definitely true but I'd say the most common situation is isn't where people are mobile and moving around, it's much more your company, you know, you, you might have some developers in, you know, in Poland or in Spain, and you've got some people in commercial roles in the UK, and then you open a French office to sort of build out your French, you know, your French go-to-market or whatever. So you, you've got employees in different places, and there you've got, you know, you, you either can grant out of, if you were in the UK, you could grant uh, uh, non-tax beneficial, but just vanilla stock options to those employees in those countries, uh, in those different countries, and then they will just have a different tax regime. They will have to be, their tax treatment will be according to the rules of their, whatever country they're in. That's probably the most common way it's done, or you can set up a, potentially a, a separate sort of sub-plan uh, to try and be tax beneficial to uh, employees in particular countries. So you might do that in France, for instance, because there's a tax favorable regime in France that you might want to take advantage of. And then you just have to weigh it up. So for instance, I know when um, you know, Just Eat, which we invested in very early on, when they were doing their international expansion, with each country they went into, they basically said, right, we're carving out for each country uh, per the number of employees that we expect to have in that country in 12 months time, we'll set aside a uh, 1,000 um, pounds of, uh, of legal advice money that we can take advice. So if we think that we're going to launch in Belgium and have 20 people in Belgium in a year's time, we can put £20,000 uh, into tax advice to make this as beneficial to employees as possible who are working for us in Belgium. And they did that per market. And they said to employees, this is what we're going to do. You know, we can't just spend limitless amounts of tax advice uh, and, and uh, legal advice, but we're going to carve out a certain amount and try and make it as work as well as we can for you in each country uh, within those limits. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah to, to, to sum up, it's really complicated because you have to manage different regulations across Europe and maybe across the world, and also you have to take time. Yeah, I mean, your classic and, one is in the US, where you have, yeah, you'll hear what's sure. called a 4-9-A valuation. Maybe in two seconds. If you're, <laughs> Generally higher than it is in the UK. Yeah. You can grant them at nil in the UK. So either you grant everyone at the US price and waste a bit of tax in the UK, 
or you optimize it in each country, and that's up to you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much to everyone. Let's enjoy the drinks. Give a big round of applause.